And so we've been talking about how blood covenant is so applicable to our lives, even though we haven't understood it much in our Western minds. I have begun to expound on the bedrock of my faith, which gives that overwhelming confidence, the revelation of blood covenant. A blood covenant I have with God through the blood of Jesus. A blood covenant you have with God through the blood of Jesus. We saw how it was the certainty, the confidence and assuredness Abraham had in God not even being born again so that he was willing to pick up and leave his country that he'd known and go to a place he didn't even know where he was going. That he had the confidence when God told him to, to sacrifice his son Isaac on Mount Moriah, he didn't even hesitate. We saw the young shepherd boy, David, slay Goliath when all the armies of Israel were shaking in their armor because he understood his blood covenant with Almighty God. We have done unbelievers a disservice by not explaining to them that they're entering into an unbreakable blood covenant with Almighty God, which means that all God has and is is at our disposal, including the new birth and the promise of heaven, but on the covenant converse side, all that we have, all that we are, is to be at God's disposal. Amen. That is why we will have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of what we did after we made Jesus Lord. Last week we saw how Dr. Stanley searching for Dr. Livingstone in Africa cut covenant, cut blood covenant more than 50 times. Because the tribes of Africa knew about blood covenant. He had run into an equatorial tribe particularly fierce. And it was his interpreter (coughs) that introduced him to blood covenant. Amen. He said, well, why don't you cut covenant with the chief? And when he explained that it meant drinking each other's blood, he was repulsed. And he thought, no, I'm not going to do that. The situation kept worsening. And again, his interpreter said, why don't you cut covenant with the chief? And finally he realized that he did not have the means to fight this tribe. And he cut covenant, blood covenant. All of a sudden, all of his problems disappeared. Amen. Now, we talked about what blood covenant exactly means. Um. This is how Stanley cut covenant. There was a questioning to ascertain if both parties were able to keep the covenant. So there was a, the chief wanted to make sure Stanley could keep the covenant. He was assured he could keep the covenant. All right. Then there was an exchange of gifts. All right. Oh, and besides that questioning, there was a setting of terms. Then there was an exchange of gifts, which demonstrated that all that that person had was at the other's disposal. We talked about how that, that, uh, that chief gave him, Stanley, his spear. And remember, Stanley had to give up his goat, which he was using the milk in order to keep his health right. He, he was having trouble stomaching a lot of things. And, and so, but he gave up one of the most important things he had because it was part of the covenant. And then there was the drinking of blood mixed with wine. See, now don't look at the grossness of it. You have to see the significance of it. Amen. Amen. And then there was the rubbing of the wrists where incisions were made and the bloods were mingled. Gunpowder was then rubbed into the wound so to leave a mark. Then there was a planting of trees known for their long life for a memorial. If there was no trees, they would set up a pile of rocks or some other kind of memorial. And every time they had cut. And what did Jesus say about communion? Do this in remembrance of me. See, that's what communion is. It's covenant. 
And then there was a pronouncing of cursings and blessings. Cursings for breaking the co- terms of the covenant. Blessings for keeping it. And Stanley, the, the, the witch doctor, came and pronounced some of the worst curses upon Stanley if he ever broke the covenant. He said they were just awful. It just singed his ears. But then the interpreter did the same thing to the chief if he ever broke the covenant. Blessing and cursing, that's covenant terms. We'll get into that later. But people entered into blood covenant for three main reasons. Does anybody remember what they were? Preservation or protection? You said provision? Yep. Business, so that business partners wouldn't take advantage? And just simply for love's sake. And that's what marriage is all about. You enter into a covenant for love's sake. Okay? And then one of the things Stanley brought out is that there was just evidence of blood covenants all across Africa. If you look, at, there's evidence of blood covenants in every civilization known to man. Amen. Uh, Our problem is that we haven't thought in terms of blood covenant. We don't read this in terms of blood covenant. This is old blood covenant, new blood covenant. Amen. Then we looked at four different words. It was interesting. I know Susan did it on purpose. We talked about we are a friend of God. Friend. Does anybody remember what that meant? Friend was somebody who kept the covenant, proved the covenant. Why was Abraham called the friend of God? Because he kept the covenant. He, he said, because you, God said to him, because you withheld your son, your only begotten son, I know that you are willing. You, you've kept the covenant, you proved the covenant, and he called him friend. Friend is a term we have used loosely, but it is a covenant term for a covenant partner that's proved the covenant. Because see, covenant's not in force until it's proven. It, it, it's in force, but it's not really in force until something is asked of the person that they have to give up greatly. I've talked about how God came to me. One of, my, one of my most cherished things that I had growing up was my coin collection. And God came to me and said, I want you to sell your coin collection. Oh, Lord, man, you know, I'm tithing, I'm giving, offering. I mean, you know, can't, we, can't it be something else? I mean, you know, I've been saving those coins from the time I was just a little shaver. And, and all I got was silence. So I, I, I said, okay, Lord. No, oh, man, I, I suffered. I had to pray. I had to ask God for grace. I had to, finally, I, I went, I was going to school at the time down at, at Rhema Bible Training Center, Rhema Bible College now. But I was going to school down there, and so I found a coin shop. At, like, I think it was 50, 30... 31st and Harvard, 51st and Harvard, somewhere in there. Anyway, down in Tulsa. And I said, okay, Lord, I found it. When I go home at Thanksgiving, I am going to get my coin collection. I'll bring it here. I'll sell it and give the money wherever you say. And, and, and I, I totally meant it. It was not some empty thing. It's like I raised the knife. And God says, that's okay. You don't have to do that. I just wanted you to be willing I said, Lord, man, I agonized over that. I, I, you know, it can't be anything you're not willing to give up if you're in covenant with Almighty God. Because, see, if you're willing to give up anything, God will give up anything he has, and he's got a lot more than you got. Hallelujah. So, then we talked about righteous. Righteousness is a term. Righteousness is when you're walking and keeping the terms of the covenant. That means you're in a righteous standing. Or righteousness is that standing that you're right with the covenant. Amen. 
I wish I had more time. You need to go back. I, I'm running out of time. I'm going to get too long otherwise. Then we talked about redemption, which is a covenant term, which is a blood covenant partner providing something or someone to buy us back from something that we owe. Boy, oh boy, did we ever need Jesus to come and buy us back. Amen? And then faith. Huh. Faith is a blood covenant term. It is not just, you know, so many times even when you look up definitions in the Greek dictionary, the Greek words for these things, they give just, you know, human definitions. And you've got to see this faith is a blood covenant term for a partner who deems the blood covenant terms true and acts on them. Real blood covenant faith has corresponding actions. If you believe, then you're going to act a certain way. Amen. Oh, I wish you had more time, but you, you need to go back. If you did not, were not here to hear that one, you need to go back and hear it. But I need to get into what I have for today. So last week we began seeing Bible words in terms of blood covenant. When you do this, the terms become clearly defined, whereas before the meaning can be somewhat hazy. Amen. Like we saw friend. When you see this word in blood covenant terms, it is crystal clear. Otherwise, it's somewhat subjective. In other words, defined by each person. What's friend to you is not friend to me. Okay? Friend for a lot of people is just, well, anybody is your acquaintance. But to me, a friend is somebody who's loyal, has been proven that when the chips are down, I can count on them. Amen. So I have a lot of acquaintances, but only a few friends. Glory to God. Okay? Blood covenant meanings inject iron into these words. Do you understand what I mean by that? All of a sudden, these words that can be kind of eh, subject, just wishy-washy, all of a sudden you put blood covenant in there, and it's iron. It's solid. It's secure. It's firm. Just like, why do they put re-rod into cement? To strengthen it. Amen. It gives us, gives that firmness of iron right there in that cement. Just makes that iron that much stronger. Or that much, that concrete that much stronger. Okay? Today we're going to look at a word not even used that much anymore, but when you see it in blood covenant light, you will see it a whole different way. Amen. Does anybody remember my passion? Remember, I've, said, I've shared it more than once. That's right. Have Jesus say to me, what? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Okay, very good. That's exactly my passion. What is this desire based on? In other words, where is it found in Scripture? Jesus gave us this story in Matthew 25. Let's turn there. Matthew 25, we're going to begin with verse 14. Now notice... For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. So this, this is how heaven works. This is how heaven works. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground, hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and bought, brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five talents Five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, Well done, 
good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He, who also, he also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. Now notice, isn't it interesting that the one who had received five talents, he doubled and God said to him, the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. The person who had received less, but he still doubled it, God said the same exact words to him. And so you might say, well, hey, I don't have some of the gifts and talents and abilities of some of these other people. No, maybe not. But it's not based on how much you have. It's are you faithful with what you do have? Which will make more sense in a minute. Okay, of course, what did the one with, who got one do? He buried it. What was his excuse? Oh, I was afraid because I knew you were a hard man. See, there's some people just say, well, you know, I'm a, they're going to try and say, well, God, I just, you know, I thought you were, you were hard and it was too hard to do that. And so I just buried it. And here's, here's what's yours. It's not what God wants. He wants. God wants us to be faithful. Okay? Faithful is the word we'll be looking at from a blood covenant perspective. So the name of my message today for you in the sound booth is covenant faithful. Covenant faithful. Turn to Deuteronomy 7. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The seventh chapter. This is an absolutely marvelous verse. Verse 9. Therefore know that the Lord your God, He is God. The faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations, those who love Him keep His commandments. Ho, oh, that is a dynamite verse. Faithful from a blood covenant perspective means believing and fulfilling the terms of the blood covenant. So first thing, we're going to look from God's perspective. From God's side of the covenant. He says, hey, I am... You know, Moses basically saying, therefore know that the Lord, he, your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations, those who love him, keep his commandments. Now, actually, you know, we, we've defined mercy as God not giving us what we do deserve. But think of it in covenant terms. That's when God doesn't hardline, first time, demand the curses come upon a person because they broke the covenant. That's mercy. God not giving a person what they covenant deserve. The curses they covenant deserve. That's God mercy. So notice he's a covenant keeping God and he shows mercy. Thank God. Aren't you glad for God's mercy that God didn't just automatically give you every time what you deserved? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Note that this verse calls God the faithful God. And then explains what that means. Notice it says, who keeps covenant and mercy for how long? A thousand generations. You know what a generation is? 40 to 70 years. That's 40,000 to 70,000 years. See, so you've got to think of it, you've got to break that down. Our problem is that we have looked at this book from a purely human eyes for too long. We need to look at the Bible as two blood covenants. The old blood covenant, the new blood covenant. Now, even in the light of Israel's unfaithfulness, 
and the prospect of going into to captivity, the writer of Lamentations, I think it's Jeremiah, but I didn't take time to look that up. But let's go to the book of Lamentations. It's right after the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Lamentations, the third chapter. Starting with verse 22. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now, what does that remind you of? The hymn. In fact, actually, if we could, Maria, if you could... um, is Maria in here, or is she in with the kids? I'm not seeing her. Is she here? Okay. I need, if she could find great is thy faithfulness for us to sing at the end. I think that, that after I preach this, it's going to mean a lot more to you. Okay? Notice, great is thy faithfulness. So his mercy is great, his faithfulness is great. And notice they they were they had the prospect of going into captivity. They had been extremely disobedient. They had ignored Isaiah, they are ignoring Jeremiah. They're, in fact, some of these prophets, I think Isaiah the prophet was sawed in two. Can you imagine? They took a saw to him and sawed him in two. Alive. Would you like to be sawed in two alive? Pretty nasty. But see, that's how mad they were. Because they didn't want to hear the truth. And because of that, I believe it was Jeremiah wrote Lamentations. Why? Because basically, he's saying, hey, God's giving you Another chance to turn. God's giving you another chance to turn from your wicked ways and begin to keep covenant with God. But the lamentations were, a lament means what? That's cry, cry of sorrow. Being sorry. And the prophet was sorry. God was sorry because they weren't listening. God was sorry because they were going to go into captivity. But he said, through the Lord's mercies we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He's saying, Lay, I'm giving you a last call here. God's a good God. Great is his faithfulness. Through his compassions and mercies, we're not consumed. They don't fail. But if you don't turn, that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to go into captivity, and that's what they did. They went into captivity into Babylon. And it was tough. Very, very tough. But see, that's what happens. And see, the, the, Jonathan Kahn wrote two books about Harbinger warning America that we need to turn, that we were in a parallel with Israel. And we've been blessed for all these years. We've been so blessed. But it's because we've kept God as our God. But now there's all these people that have been allowed to come in in the name of freedom. In the name of rights. And try to turn our country down a wicked path. A path of socialism. A path of communism. path of of godlessness. Because socialism and communism, the reason that they are so evil is because they eliminate God. Or if they, if they don't eliminate God, they have some figurehead religion like 
the Russian Orthodox in communist Russia that's playing along with the government. They're just going through the motions, giving lip service to God. There's no real heart change going on. Amen. Covenant partners entering into blood covenant would swear faithfulness on the terms of the covenant. To the terms of the covenant. And we need to know God remains faithful even if we aren't. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 15. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now, Paul, what's Paul saying here? He's saying, even if it's just a man's blood covenant, it cannot be annulled or canceled out. It cannot be added to. But he said, this is not a man's covenant. This is not a covenant of men. How much more a covenant with God who could swear by no one greater, swore by himself. In other words, guaranteed the covenant by himself. Turn to Hebrews 6. Hebrews chapter 6. You know, it's interesting, just out of curiosity, I, I, I took my Strong's Concordance and, and I looked up the word covenant. It is amazing how many times the word covenant is used in the Bible. I didn't take the time to count it up. Maybe I will this week and get the number back to you, but it's amazing how many times that word's used. Amen. Hebrews 6, let's start with verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. So he swore by himself. In other words, he guarantees himself. You know, if God ever broke the covenant, he'd have to destroy himself. That puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Okay, look at the next verse. And so after he had patiently endured, he received the promise. Talking about Abraham. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. See, that's talking about a man's blood covenant now. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his word, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. What does the word immutable mean? Unchangeable, unalterable. It is rock solid, folks. There is no change No possibility of change. Willing and God determined to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise. Who's the heirs of promise? We are. And it was the the people of the old covenant as well. But he was willing to show to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. Confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable, unchangeable, unalterable things in which it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. It is impossible for God to lie. We might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now, it says two things. Well, the first thing is God's, it's impossible for God to lie. What's the second thing? He does not change. But he swore by himself. In other words, God's guarantee is himself. (laughs) 
That's two unmutable things. God can't lie, so he swore by himself. So that makes two things. He swore by himself, and he said, I'm the guarantee of what I just said. It's impossible for me to lie. Impossible. What does that do? That we might have strong consolation. Man, I'll guess. Strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. Now remember, I've talked about hope. Hope is a confident expectation of good things. What's that hope based on? It's based on blood covenant. Why? Because we can read this and go, hey, those things belong to us. Strong consolation. And there's refuge in that kind of hope. Glory to God. See, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what the circumstances look like, no matter what kind of attack you're on, and it is so, it is a blood covenant promise. You can stand on it. You can count on it. He doesn't change. He doesn't lie. He made a blood covenant promise for it to not come to pass if you dare to believe he would have to destroy himself. And he's not going to do that. If you will not let go in faith and believing, it's going to come to pass like God said, period. Now you might have to stand for a while, just like Abraham did, because it takes time sometimes to get something from the spirit realm into the natural where we need it. And of course, that's when Satan's going to attack. Because he's going to try to get you to let go of it. Amen. So this should put such a confident expectation in your spirit and soul that acts like an anchor. Notice the next verse. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the present behind the veil. See, I'll tell you what this is talking about is you, you have this hope. It goes right into the very presence of God. It's to be the anchor of your soul. What's the purpose of an anchor? To hold something steady. When a ship drive anchor is because it would hit the bottom and the weight of that anchor and the chain that it was on would hold that ship in place. Amen. You ever seen the anchors of some of those huge World War II battleships? Or some of those... Aircraft carriers, oh, massive, massive. The chain links are like this, that thick around. I mean, just massive because it takes a big anchor. Well, we have hope, confident expectation of good things as an anchor to our soul. When we understand blood covenant, That's why I have such confidence. That's why I have such assurance. Because I know God can't lie. I know that if I will not let go of things in faith, it will come to pass. Period. Now see, that's for me. Now you can use your faith on behalf of others to a certain point. But the rules change a bit, so you have to be careful when you're believing for somebody else. Just like recently, I prayed for somebody that I found out was sick with COVID. And what happened? Power of God went out of me. I could feel the transfer. What happened to the person? They died. Does that shake my confidence? No. Because... What God witnessed to me is that this person, by the time I found out about it, they were close to death already. And I think they got a glimpse of heaven. And see, I tell you, when when a person gets a glimpse of heaven, their own will kicks in and they, they, Jesus sometimes will give them a choice. You want to stay here and fight or do you want to go home? And a lot of them will go, man, I'm going. I'm out of here. Forget this popsicle stand, I'm done. And so they go. 
And to be with Christ is far better. So it doesn't shake. As far as I'm concerned, in my mind, I got the answer. And whether they receive the answer, that's between them and God. But see, I know every time I ask, God hears me. All right, this is a little side journey. Hold your place in Hebrews here. Go to 1 John 5. First John 5, verse 14. And th- now this is the confidence, the assurance, the certainty that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, how do we know his will? From his word, which is the word of the blood covenant. If we ask anything according to his will, he does what? He hears us. Was it God's will to heal that man? You better believe it. He heard me. Now whether he received it. See, there's a difference. When you're praying for someone else, their will comes in. When you're praying for yourself, the only will you're dealing with is yourself. So you can get that answer every time, all the time, continuously, assuredly. Now notice verse 15. And if we know he hears us, and if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we know he hears us, whatever we ask, we know. We know what? That we have the petitions that we asked of him. We know we have it. (laughs) Just like some time ago, I have some symptoms of an inguinal hernia. And I could go and get that patched up by the doctors, but I choose to believe God. And I've got my answer. Even though some lying symptoms are trying to persist, I have my answer, and my body's got to line up. I've got it. Sometimes I'll just look at the symptoms and I'll go, ha, ha, ha. You lying symptoms. But see, that kind of confidence doesn't come by accident. It comes by revelation. That's why I prayed this morning. I prayed that you would get a revelation of what I'm talking about. That all of you will develop this unshakable, unmovable, total assurance That whatever God promised, you can ask, he hears you, and you receive it by faith. (laughs) Glory to God. Go back to Hebrews 6 now. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Why? Because it's the soul that Satan attacks, the mind, will, and emotions. He puts thoughts in your mind. He tries to affect your emotions. He tries to get you to make decisions with your will that are contrary to God. Amen. All right? So this means if God ever broke the covenant, he'd have to destroy himself, which means, as the scripture declares, it's impossible for God to lie. This should put such a confident expectation in your spirit and soul that it acts like an anchor to keep you firm, unwavering, and not doubting. I want you to turn to the book of Psalms. We'll start with Psalm 36. Now, I just want to point this out, just, just a note, which I pointed out to Daryl one time when we were med- meditating on Scripture. The whole book is the book of Psalms. The word Psalms means what? Songs. But each psalm It's not Psalms 36, it's Psalm 36. It's a specific song. Just just a little side note there. Psalm 36. We're going to look at several scriptures declaring the faithfulness of God. 
Verse 5, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Woo-hoo, glory to God. So get your fingers nimble. Now go to Psalm 40, verse 10. Psalm 40, verse 10. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I've declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness, your truth from the great assembly. This, I believe, is a psalm of David. And David's saying, hey, I haven't hidden what you've given me. I've let it shine forth. I've not hidden your faithfulness from the people. Just how faithful you've been to me. All right? Psalm 89. This is a psalm of faithfulness. It'd be worth reading the whole thing. I don't have time to read the whole thing, but we're going to read a good portion of it. Because it is like this word's used like every other verse. Psalm 89, beginning with verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth. I'll make known your what? Faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. See, God, it's going to come to pass. Every bit of this covenant is going to come to pass, including the book of Revelation. It's going to come to pass the way he said Amen. I have made a what? Covenant with my chosen. So you're part of that. You're his chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Now this is really talking about who? Jesus. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. Glory to God. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? The Lord is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. To be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. I mean, this is the very essence of God. He is a covenant keeper. He is a one who will do what he promised. Glory to God. Let's look at verse 24 now. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Again, this is talking about Jesus, but it also applies to us. Verse 33. Nonetheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break. Notice the connection between covenant and faithfulness nor alter the word that's gone out of my lips. Glory to God. Oh, we could just keep going, but I got to keep moving here. Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Verse 1. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and sing praises. To, let's see here. Don't do that. One and two. Sing praises to your name almost high. Declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night. God is faithful. He performs what he said he will do. The Bible says in Jeremiah 1.12, it says he watches over his word to perform it. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it seems like. God watches over his word to perform it. Psalm 119, verse 90. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. Glory to God. Psalm 143, verse 1. This is the last one we're going to look at. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. In your faithfulness answer me. And in your righteousness. Glory to God. In your faithfulness answer me. So what can we conclude from this? God is a blood covenant keeping God. We have a blood covenant with God through the blood of Jesus. Therefore, we can count on God keeping his blood covenant promises with all the assuredness and confidence that the word of God affords. Look here in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 23. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our confident expectation of good things without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. He's faithful. This is no matter what our five senses tell us. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by and not by sight or our five senses. No matter what they say about COVID, God's faithful. No matter what kind of diagnosis the doctor gives you, God is faithful. No matter what forecast there is for your financial situation, God is faithful. God tells Israel, He's sending someone, the Messiah, the promised one, no matter how long it seems. He is coming. Why? Because the Lord is faithful. Turn to Isaiah 49. Because, see, I'll tell you, God knew that Israel would start going, where, where is the promised one? Where's the promise of his coming? In fact, it had been so long that the Pharisees and Sadducees discounted Jesus. That, that can't be him. He didn't, he's not coming the way I thought. No, God doesn't come the way we think. God comes the way he wants. Amen. Isaiah 49, verse 7, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despised. Now he's talking about Jesus. To him whom the nation abhors, to the servants, uh, servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. He has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I've heard you. In the day of salvation I've helped you. I'll preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people. As a covenant to the people. See, there's the blood covenant that Jesus made with us. To restore the earth. To cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. That you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads and their pastures will be in all the desolate heights. He goes on to make all these wonderful promises. The Messiah is coming. He says, don't give up. I have said it. The, the promise is sure. The Messiah is going to come. Hebrews 11, 11, You can write this down. The Bible says, Sarah counted God faithful when he said, that she would bear Isaac. She judged God faithful who had promised. So that's God's part. We'll start talking about our part. Us being faithful means we're keepers of the written part of the covenant and the spoken part. This means being doers of the word of God. This means being led consistently by the Holy Spirit. This means we don't pick and choose what we like to do and what we want to do, but what God says to do by His Word and by His Spirit. I think it's interesting when I follow up on someone I haven't seen at church for some time and ask them how they're doing, a lot of times, you know what I hear? Oh, I'm doing good. And what I want to say, and I bite my tongue, but what I want to say is, according to whose standards? Sometimes people, I haven't seen them in church for a month or two, and and, and, we're doing good. Really? Based on whose standards? Obviously it's their own. (laughs) Because you can't keep missing church and stay in tight fellowship with God. Church wasn't my idea. Being a pastor wasn't my idea. Being a pastor's wife sure wasn't my wife's idea. She said she'd never marry a pastor. Well, glory to God, look what happened. But see, it's part of the covenant. I didn't choose to do this. No, I'm glad to do it. I do it with joy. Because I have wonderful people to pastor. But the, the thing is, is that this, this is, you know, I think sometimes people, and part of the problem is we live in the United States of America, we get so doggone independent. 
So we just think that, well, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Oh, really? Mm Mm-hmm. Go ahead and say that to God then. Uh, I'm, on Friday night, we had our two grandsons, Silas and Miles, over. And when I walked in, I walked into the entryway. Silas was having an interesting discussion with Jeremy. <laughs> and he didn't have a very good attitude. And he was talking back to Jeremy. And I said, listen, son. I said, you don't talk that way to your dad. The Bible says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. You know, he was just, he was in, later on he apologized. Oh, grandpa, I'm really sorry. That wasn't right the way I was acting. And I said, good, I'm glad you recognized that. Amen. But he was just, I mean, wasn't that Jeremy was asking anything unreasonable from him? But he's just looking at him and goes, No, I don't want to do that. I think sometimes that's what we do. I don't want to do that. I think about Jesus. You know, what if he'd have said that? Get crucified? Die a horrible death and go to hell for three days, three days, get a life. Dream on. I love the song by Clay Cross. He walked a mile in my shoes where it says, he did not hide himself away. He was no stranger to our pain. He could have. He didn't have to do what he did, but he did it. Because of covenant. He didn't wait for us to get good enough. Because we couldn't get good enough. It took his blood to make us good enough. If we evaluate ourselves by our own standards, we're going to miss it. See, I'm not the one. Turn to Hebrews 10. I'm not the one who said these words. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day there? That's the return of Christ. Anybody see that day approaching? So what do we need to do that much more? Not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Not my ideal. Turn to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. Getting mighty quiet in here. See, everybody likes all about God. What God's side of the covenant is. What God will do for us. How he's the healer and the saver and the preserver and the protector and all those things. But then you start talking about our side of the covenant. It gets quiet because people go, well, you're asking something from me now, Pastor. Yeah, not me though. God. First Peter 4 verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards. We don't use the word steward much anymore. What's a word we use? Manager. As managers of the manifold grace of God. The word manifold means many faceted. We're stewards of that grace. If anyone speaks, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If anyone ministers or serves, let him do as with ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
We do not become good and faithful servants by accident, but by intentional actions. Last night I forgot, I was going to prayer and my wife had given me music to bring. And I went and walked out without it. So today, I was, this, this, this message was more difficult to prepare because there was so much I had to try to capsulate it and get it in order so it would come out just right. And so I knew I needed somebody to pick up that music so it would be here for the music people. So I called somebody. And you know who I called? I called a faithful person. And you know what they said? I'll get ready right away and come. They weren't planning to come that early. Amen. And they picked up that music and saved me so I could get my message done in time. Even though I started my message at four in the morning, it just took a long time. And, you know, I was thinking about last night, even though sometimes when no one else shows up at prayer on Saturday night, I know Pastor John and Marine are going to come. I don't have to wonder if they might be a little late. But they come. They're faithful. I don't have to wonder if they're going to be there. They're going to be there. I as pastor appreciate each one of you in the faithful service that you render to God. How much more do you think God appreciates it? And how much more is he going to reward you? Turn to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6, verse 10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you've shown toward his name and that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence of full assurance of hope until the end. God hasn't forgot. God doesn't forget. Everything you do for him is going to get rewarded. We're all stewards, managers of our gifts, talents, abilities, resources, time. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Oh, 1 Corinthians 4, excuse me. I wrote it down wrong. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards or managers of the mysteries of God. Remember what the word mystery means? Something previously hidden but now revealed. Stewards of the things previously hidden but now revealed. Moreover, it is required in stewards or managers that one be found what? Faithful. We are all stewards. You say, well, that's you, Pastor Ben. You're a steward of the mysteries of God. Yeah, but I'll tell you, you know enough. In fact, you know more than most people, and you can be sharing that with others. As a minister of the word of the covenant, I'm steward of the mysteries of God, things previously hidden, but now made known, but so are you what you know and who you come across. Let's, we'll close with this verse, Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. You know, when making a point about Jesus, you know who Paul, who I believe is the writer of, of Hebrews, do you know who he brings up? To compare Moses. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses was also faithful in all his house. What was the house of Moses? Children of Israel. All two million plus women and children. Can you imagine having to oversee them in the desert? Those whining, complaining, stiff-necked, sometimes hard-hearted, 
Blessings. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know why Moses didn't get to go into the promised land? He got so irritated one time, what did he do? Struck the rock. Well, the rock was Christ, and that was a no-no, so it kept him out of the promised land. But he said he was called faithful in all his house. House referring to the children of Israel. Now notice. For this one, talking about Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he built the house that has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone who builds all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confident rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. If we're going to be judged if we're faithful or not, is it important that we be faithful? Yeah. And I want, it is my passion, not only my passion to have him say, well done, good and faithful servant to me, but to say it to all of you. I do not want you to be at the judgment seat of Christ with weeping and gnashing of teeth. That just doesn't sound like fun. No. But folks, If you do not prepare to be faithful, you will not. You won't be. Glory to God. I think I got it all out. There was a lot in there. Hallelujah. Now, talking about being stewards or managers, we're managers of our resources. And that starts with the tithe. The word tithe means tenth. So if you get $200, what's a tenth? 20. If you get $2,000, what's a tenth? 200. That starts. The tithe doesn't even belong to us. It belongs to God. And then above and beyond that, as God directs. And that's part of our stewardship. Because it all belongs to God. It's just we get to manage it for a time. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as our director, Lord over the managers of this earth, each one of us. We ask you to direct us now in our giving. We already know about the tithe, but above and beyond that, as you direct, we thank you, Lord. We have ears to hear what you say. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us now as we give. In Jesus' name, and everybody agreed with that said, amen. If you are making out a check this morning, make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, want a tax-deductible receipt, raise your hand. One of the ushers give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. Praise you, Jesus, for healthy sneezes, whoever that was. Glory to God. That's something you can say. It even rhymes. Praise you, Jesus, for healthy sneezes. Glory to God. So I say that all the time. If I sneeze, who praise you, Jesus, for healthy sneezing. You know, you know, people say, God bless you, but that's not nearly as good. Hallelujah. Because what are you doing? You're calling, even if it's an unhealthy sneeze, you're calling it healthy. You're calling those things which be not as though they were. Amen. Anybody else need an envelope for cash giving? All right, let's all stand then. Let's present our tithes and offerings to him. See, this is, this is where we make our covenant declarations. Because remember, faith is in our mouth and in our heart. So out of our heart comes through the lips our de- declaration to God. Say it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I, bring my tithes, I bring my tithes. I give my offerings because I want to be faithful in all things. And I thank you that you perform your word back onto me. You're not deceived. You're not not mocked. mocked. Whatever I sow, sow, I also reap reap. in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen.